Hi everybody and thank you again for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, we're gonna look at a whole stack of stuff from Kame TV. We're gonna start off with this clamp, which has loads of rigging points for your spigots, small lights and articulated arms, but here's the point of difference. It also has secure mounting for a V-mount battery. We're gonna take a look at this compact 48 volt power station, which runs off dual V-mount batteries. We're also gonna take a look at some of their compact V-mount batteries that they have available. We'll also take a look at this uh, Bowen mount Fresnel, which has dual optics. Now this thing increases the light output by about 500%. And we're also gonna take a look, if we get time, at one of their, um, what's this? This is a three foot dome. And then we'll take a look at some of the lights. We've got a 220 watt monocolor light. We've got a 310 watt bicolor light. And then we'll have a look at this incredibly powerful light here. This is 660 watts. This thing with its applied reflector pumps out nearly 17,000 lux at a distance of three meters. Okay, for those of you who have not been to my YouTube channel before, you can go to the time bar on the video and it is chaptered, so you can skip the sections you're not interested in. Also in the description, I have time code points, so you can click on those and go straight to the sections that you're interested in. Also, I'll have the links for all of the products so you can buy them. All right, so let's start off by uh, having a look at this clamp. So this is called the V-mount battery clamp, large open angle and solid structure. So that's quite a large name. The reason it's got such a large name is um, Came TV do sell a lot of V-mount clamps already, so they've got to identify it. All right, so here's what I like about this clamp, and one thing I don't like about it is I didn't know about this clamp until recently, and I bought a whole heap of um, V-mount clamps that have like a, uh, what would you call it, uh, a nano clamp on them, and they're pretty much useless, whereas this has a nice big jaw, and it'll fit uh, around the base of a um, combo stand. So even if you've got a large stand that you're using your light on, you know, you can mount your, your V-mount uh, to it, no problem at all. And it locks very securely. All of the uh, locking area is metal on it. Now, in terms of it being multi-purpose, it has loads of quarter inch and three eighths inch mounts. You can find them on the top of the jaw, on the bottom of the jaw, on the side of the jaw, you've got a three eighths and a one quarter inch with RE pin. You've got a thread mount on each side of the hinge, and you've even got four mounts on the locking knob. But just something to note, if you're gonna mount onto the locking knob, maybe that's the only position you can get to, just make sure you don't have any weight biased left to loosen, otherwise you can undo the clamp. Nice little details include a bull bearing washer, which is made out of brass, so it doesn't need any lubricating. The weak point on a lot of these clamps, particularly ones that are off brand, is the rubbers, but this doesn't just have the rubbers glued in. It looks like the rubbers are deep set, so I couldn't physically remove them. Now, if you're really pressed for mounting points, the jaw on this can lock strong enough to hold an articulated arm, a small light, and of course, the battery on the V-mount. So again, this sells for 35 US bucks, and the link is in the description below. Okay, now let's have a look at the power station. So this is called the Kame TV 48 volt DC output dual V-mount battery plate power station, which is currently selling for 110 US dollars. Now that's pretty good value because it also comes with the V-mount clamp that we just reviewed so you can mount it to your light stands. All right, so let's talk about what this thing does. So it takes two 14.8 volt V-mount batteries and it, um, converts that to 48 volts regulated out so you can run your 48 volt lights. Now, these guys claim that you can output 480 watts or 10 amps maximum out. So a lot of manufacturers that make these also have the same claim. So here's something you need to know. So the weak point on this whole system or a whole system like this is the pins on your battery. So this is a high capacity, high discharge battery, 310 watt hour. So you're probably thinking there, 310, 310, hey, that's 620 watt hour. You can run a big light off this. Well, if I run a sky panel, for example, off something like this, um, I will get to about 40 minutes and then the batteries turn off. So what happens is when I get to about 40 minutes and the battery's starting to get flat, as the battery goes flat, the voltage goes down 
and the amperage goes up and then you exceed the 15 amps on the pins and the battery shuts down prematurely. So that is the biggest limiting factor. So if you're looking to have power stations like this to run your 48 volt lights and you wanna use all of the power capability that's in the batteries, in other words, run the batteries you know, to close to flat or to flat, you really don't wanna be running anything bigger than 300 watts. Now, I've tested this with an Aperture Nova P300 and it can run that very well. Now, just a quick pickup, something I forgot. Also included in this kit is a cable which goes from the three pin to the 48 volts in on the two lights here. So this is the battery option that's available for those lights. Now, in terms of negatives, I only have the one negative with this system and that is the cooling fan. So it does take a bit of time for the cooling fan to kick in. It doesn't have any in-between modes. The fan is either running at 100% or at 0%. And I've got to say, this is possibly the loudest fan on any device that's come in here for gear review. So in a nutshell, I think this is great value for money, fantastic device for running your 48 volt lights, as long as you're not in a sound sensitive environment. So you might have to buy some more expensive brands if you're looking to do this, to have them around close to the camera or close to the microphones where you're filming. And for lights in your background, this is a cheaper option that'll get you out of trouble. So again, this is $110 and includes the clamp. All right, so let's talk about the batteries. And these are called the Kame TV Mini 99, lightweight battery, Samsung 18650 with two DTAP and one USB five volt outlet. Now you can get different prices on these. As a single battery, they sell for $160. If you're gonna buy two in a kit, that is $290. And for $401, you can get the power station with the clamp and two of these batteries as an option to run the two lights that are here. Now the batteries seem fairly well constructed. You've got a USB port on the top and you've got a D-tap on either side, which look to me to be gold plated and they are rated at 15 amps out. And unlike some other batteries I've had in the past, you cannot put a D-tap connector in the wrong way round. And all of the V-mount pins have also been plated to reduce resistance. And because these things do have genuine Samsung cells, they can output 15 amps. And linked up with the uh, 48 volt power station, they can run these lights, but you don't get a lot of runtime. So you're looking at about 48 minutes of runtime on the 220D, and on the 310B, you're looking at about 32 minutes of runtime. All right, so let's take a look at the Fresnel, and this is a bit different to your average Fresnel. So it's got two sets of optics in it. It's got a lens at the back, which concentrates all of the light onto the front uh, Fresnel or the front element. And that results in a large amount of light output. So when I tested it with the uh, 220D here and the 310B here, I got five times more light level or six times the original amount of light level that you get off the naked COB. So that's the pro, huge amount of light output. Now let's get into the negative. So the first negative for a lot of people might be the fact that it only floods out to 40 degrees. So its flood spot range is 40 to 12 degrees. Now it doesn't have sharp shadows that you might expect from a Fresnel and it doesn't barn door cut, which is probably why it doesn't come with a set of barn doors. So it doesn't act like your old school, say tungsten Fresnel would. It's sort of somewhere between a good reflector and a Fresnel, but it does give you that intense amount of output. So if you think about it as an intensifier, that's where it makes sense. Now, I do have one possible negative for this, and I do say possible negative. If you're an owner operator and you take care of your equipment, this won't be a problem. But if you're using equipment like this in hostile environments or renting it out, the build quality on this does have one issue. So the back here is all metal, but it's secured to the rest of the light via these three screws here, 
and that does seem to be the weak point. So in my testing, I thought, what would happen if I had it in full spot and I gave the front of it a whack? Well, this is what happens. Those three screw points are the Achilles heel in the design. There just simply isn't enough metal at this point here to stop the screw from going through. Now, if you're an owner operator who looks after your equipment, I don't think this would be a problem, but I definitely wouldn't be renting this out. Now, in terms of how this thing performs, you can see that when we do the testing for the two lights. Now, this sells for 158 US dollars, and there is a link below in the description. Okay, so let's take a look at their softbox, and this is the 120 centimeter version, and this sells for 197 US dollars. Okay, so I'm gonna start with it assembled and work my way backwards just to get the big negative out of the way. So the only negative I've got really is this grid. So the idea of the grid is it's meant to control the beam, tighten the beam up, stop it from spreading. Now, most grids that work well will either have large cells like this has, but with very thick walls, or they will have very thin walls like this has and very small cells. This, in my opinion, has the wrong combination. It's got large cells with thin walls. So the result of that is it has a beam spread of, I'm guessing, of about 100 degrees, whereas I would like mine to have a beam spread of about 45 degrees. So here, if I stand off at about what I'm guessing is outside 90 degrees, you can see that I'm still illuminated by it. So in a uh, relatively small environment, this would be spreading everywhere. So if I put this at 90 degrees uh, to the wall, you can see it's illuminating the wall here and there's enough gap here that I can walk through it. So it's still not you know, incredibly tight to the wall. So that's my overwhelming negative with it is the grid is unfortunately not that effective. Now let's have a look at the front diffuser and it's got what I would consider to be like a magic cloth or a Shamira white diffuser. It's quite a dense milky diffuser. And this softbox actually does a very good job of evenly illuminating this surface, despite the fact that it doesn't have a baffold. It's not perfect, but it is amongst the best domes I've seen in terms of even distribution of light. Now let's have a look at the dome itself. So it's quite good build quality. All the stitching is very well done. The silver is not the purest silver I've seen on a dome. It does have a little bit of green and purple sort of shading in there. Pretty much the same as with the aperture unit, so it's not enough to really affect the quality of the light coming out of the front. Now, uh, things I do like, improvements this has, my other domes, I have problems with the rods coming out of the ends here as they've gotten older, but that's not gonna happen with this because all of the rods or wires go into a sleeve at this point, and from here on out, that's a solid sleeve to the end encasing that wire. So not only is that gonna stop the wires from coming out of position and stop them from tangling if someone mishandles the unit, but it also gives you a very taut, very strong shape. Now having a look at the shell from the outside, it's a grid cloth material. So that means if it does get a hole, it won't tear all the way across. It'll start to rip until it gets to the next thick section of grid cloth, which will stop it from tearing. And like most soft boxes on the market, it has a quick release system where the rods are connected to the bow and mount. So again, this is the 120 centimeter version, which sells for 197 bucks. If you want the 90 centimeter version, that sells for 168 US bucks. All right, let's start going over the lights. We'll have a look at the 220D first, and we'll start off with the pros and cons. Let's do the cons first to get those out of the way. Now, in terms of the cons, we need to put them into some sort of perspective here. This light sells for 288 US dollars, so you're not gonna expect it to compete with lights that cost over a thousand bucks. All right, so in terms of pros and cons, it doesn't have uh, any DMX, fair enough for the price. It doesn't have a lumen radio, fair enough for the price. It doesn't have an IP rating, so you can't use it out in the rain. Well, actually you can use it out in the rain, but it probably won't survive. The biggest con for me is the length of cable between the power supply and the light. That's your maximum length there because it doesn't come with a head lead. The next thing that might be a con for some people is it doesn't come with a bag. So you're gonna to have to figure out how you're gonna store it and transport it. The only other negative I've got with this is the user interface. It is a bit slow in its processing. So once you select a parameter like dimming, for example, it is very responsive. But when you're changing your parameters, this thing is really slow to update 
update the user interface. All right, let's get into the pros and the unit is very solidly built with the exception of the safety glass on the front and the user interface. Everything else is metal. Now, things where manufacturers usually cut corners on entry level lights like the lock offs, uh, this lock off here is machined aluminium. The um, ratchet handle here is also metal. They've cut a few corners here by using, say, a tripod uh, head mount instead of a yoke, but it does have the advantage of having an umbrella mount. So the build quality, um, the color render, the color render when dimming, stuff like that, all very, very good, especially for the price. Let's see what you get for your money. All right, so this sells for 288 US dollars. There's a link in the description below. So let's take a look at what you get. Now everything's packed securely into the box, but it doesn't come with a bag. All right, so let's start pulling stuff out. So you've got your instruction manual. You've got a power supply. Now the, the power supply does have this strain relief, so you can put it on a light stand. This is in a separate plastic bag when you first unpack everything. So if you're wondering what it's for, it goes through here on the uh, cable. You get your regional power cable, which is an IEC connector at one end. You get a faceted dish or reflector. And you of course get the light. Now, one thing to note is these lights can also run off a phone app, but I don't bother reviewing phone apps. All right, so let's see how this thing performs. First off, with no modifier attached. And this light produces a very wide, even beam that could easily light a large area or light up a large modifier. And as a point source light, this has very crisp shadows. Now let's take a look with the supplied reflector. This gives you a little bit over double the amount of light and has a surprisingly even beam for a faceted dish. The shadow qualities, however, are not great, but they are fairly consistent across the beam. Now let's take a look with the optional Fresnel. Whilst optically this is not the best Fresnel I've come across, you can't do good barn door cuts for example, and it doesn't come with barn doors, it does increase the light by one heck of a lot. You've got a bit over two and a half times the amount of light that you are getting out of the dish. As far as shadow qualities go, it's not what I'd expect from a Fresnel. Okay, now let's start taking a look at the 320B. Let's go through the pros and cons first. Now to set some sort of expectation, this light sells for 440 US dollars. So it is an entry level light. So it's a bit unfair to compare it to lights that cost over $1,000. Now in terms of cons, for me, it doesn't have an IP rating, so you can't use it outside in the rain. It doesn't have my favorite thing, which is CRMX radio control, and fair enough for the price. Now the unit does have DMX control, but as a negative there, it has these micro DMX inputs, so you're gonna to have to need adapter cables. Just like with the 220D, the user interface is a little bit slow with its processing. Once you've selected a parameter, it is very responsive. However, when you're changing your parameter options or going through the menu pages, it has about a one second lag behind the input controls. I think the biggest negative for me overall is the amount of cable connecting the light to the power supply. There's not a lot of reach here, which would limit this in terms of rigging capabilities. Other negatives for me include how it dims at 5,600 Kelvin. It does change its CCT a little bit and it does go green. Now, if you're just using it dimmed at this point as say a constant brightness level, I don't think you're gonna notice it, but if you're looking to do, to do a fade to black, this is very obvious and you can see this in my DMX testing. In terms of its pros, it does have very good color render scores at daylight. And in its warm whites, it has sensational TM30 color render results, scores of 96 and 95. The light does have DMX capability and its DMX queuing is reasonably good for the price. In terms of other pros, the build quality. It is a solid metal housing with the exception of the glass front 
and the user interface. Now to cut on corners here, they're using a generic housing. So this unit is actually a bit oversized. So what I mean by that, as you can hear when I tap it, the housing is actually one third empty. Just like with the 220, the lock-offs are all metal and they've cut a few corners here price-wise by not having a stirrup. Okay, so the 310B sells for 440 US dollars. Let's open the box and see what you get. Now, just like with the 220D, everything is packed in securely, but you don't get a bag. Okay, so let's start pulling things out. You get an instruction manual. You get a power supply. You get your regional power cable, which has an IEC connector at the one end. You get the light, of course. And you get a faceted dish or reflector. All right, so let's see how this light performs. First off, with no modifiers attached. And this light delivers a beautiful wide, even spread that could easily light up a large modifier, such as an octodome or a lantern. The characteristics are the same, regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And the light has beautiful crisp shadows. Now let's have a look with the supplied dish. Now the faceted dish gives you a beam that's about as even as most dishes do, but it is delivering over three times the amount of light. The shadow qualities, however, are not fantastic. And like with most dishes, the shadow quality is not consistent across the beam. Now let's take a look with the optional Fresnel. Now if you think about this Fresnel, in terms of it being an intensifier, it is doing an awesome job. We're getting 7,020 lux at 5,600 Kelvin at a distance of 3 meters from a 310 watt light. But compared to most Fresnels, the shadow qualities are dull. Okay, so let's talk about the 660D now. So this sells for, what is it, 1,288 US dollars. So that's quite a bit of money, but it's actually quite cheap for something uh, as powerful as this. Now this comes in two parts. So you've got the head and you've got a separate controller with the, uh, with the inputs, outputs, and the power supply. All right, so let's go through um, my uh, the cons and pros. My first con is, the power supply doesn't have a mount, or the controller doesn't have a mount to put it onto your light stand. Um, not necessarily a con, but the head lead is only five meters long, which is plenty of lead normally, but if you're trying to get up to the top of a light stand and you don't have the controller mounted, five meters of head lead might not get you there. So that's the uh, first uh, negative with it. The next negative with it is to do with the DMX. The DMX has insane smoothing. So if you want to do an instant uh, cut to black, you're looking at about three to four seconds of smoothing as it, as it dials down to black. So in terms of using the DMX for cues, it's uh, pretty much uh, useless for that. It's good for setting your levels, but no good for doing cues or, or trying to get a command to happen on a mark. Um, the next uh, negative for me, is the uh, fan noise. So the head's actually pretty quiet, but there is a fan here in the controller. So that is a little bit on the loud side if, the, um, if you have to turn your fans uh, up in intensity. Now let's get into the pros. Now, unlike the other lights, this one can run directly off V-mount batteries. So it needs two batteries on either side of the controller. Now, when you run it off batteries, it runs at 60% of the maximum brightness. That's what I've metered it in as running at. Now, in terms of other pros, this light seems to be completely flicker free. 
So in the on their website, they say that this is running pulse width modulation. Now, according to my frequency meter, there's no frequency. So that could mean one of two things. It could be running pulse width modulation, but it might have a really slow decay rate on the LEDs between the pulses, filling in the gaps, or I suspect it's actually running potentiometer dimming. But uh, either way, this seems to be, as far as I can tell, completely flicker free. I can't seem to get any uh, catcher, any flicker with a high speed shutter when I'm taking stills photos. Um, in terms of other pros with it, it's dimming characteristics in terms of its um, CCT, its uh, white point accuracy in terms of Delta UV, and its color render hardly shift when you're dimming the unit. So very stable color renditions throughout its dimming cycle. The user interface is extremely easy to use and very, very straightforward. Unlike the other two units, this light does come with a bag and all the insides are custom cut and very secure. Just like with the other units, the housing is extremely solid, all metal. And where this thing really does hero is in terms of its brightness levels. It really is punching above its weight, particularly with the reflector. So it sells for $1,288, and unlike the other lights, it does come in a bag, and it is a very well-built, very solid bag. But one thing to note, it doesn't have any wheels. Now looking inside the bag, everything is packed really securely, but as a criticism, the head lead has to be packed in a tighter circle than I'd prefer. All right, so let's start pulling things out. You get an instruction manual. Uh, in this bag here, you've got a safety chain or safety wire. You've got the locker for the stand mount and some spare fuses and an Allen key. You get a five meter head lead. You get your regional power cable. Well, there's a few things here. You get your regional power cable, which has a Nutrix connector at one end. You get a five pin XLR, so I'm guessing this is a DMX cable. You get the light, of course. Now the light doesn't have any controls on the head. All of the controls are on the controller, which is also the power transformer. You get a faceted dish. Now this dish is bigger than your regular Bowens mount dish, so it does give a massive amount of intensity and you get the controller. Okay, so let's take a look over the controller now. Now on both sides of the unit, you have V-mount battery plates. You require two batteries to run this light. And running off the V-mounts, it runs at 60% brightness. On the input side of the controller, we have a physical on-off switch, which actually disconnects the power going into the light. We have our Nutrix power in. We have our power out to our light. We have our DMX out and our DMX in, which are five pin XLR. We have a DC inlet, which is 36 to 48 volts. So that's quite a bit of range. That's unusual on a light this size. And next to that, we have our USB port. Now this USB port does have power out, so you can use it to power a CRMX receiver. On top, there's a button to switch to the DC inlet. Also on top is an antenna for phone app operation. Now let's take a look at the user interface side. And this light really is easy to drive. Essentially, this is your menu system here. For normal operation, you select your intensity mode and twist the knob to adjust your brightness. With the special effects menu, you've got multiple parameters. To select your parameter, just press the button. Now I've got mode selected, I can select which effect it is that I'm running. If I want to change the speed, press the button again to get to the next parameter. All right, let's go back to normal operation. If I wanna change my DMX address, just press the DMX button and spin the knob to select my address. Next is your fan speeds. You've got a choice of low, medium, high, and automatic. Next button is your phone app control. So you can select your address and you can scan the QR codes to download the app. And finally, you've got your language selection. Okay, let's see how this light performs. First off, with no modifiers attached. This has a very evenly distributed beam that could easily light up a large modifier. And the shadow qualities are nice and crisp. Now let's have a look with the supplied reflector. And this reflector is bigger than the average Bowen mount reflector. This results in a whopping 16,800 lux at a distance of three meters.
This faceted dish has a beam that's about as evenly distributed as most faceted dishes. But I don't know if you could call these shadows. The shadows are very sharp on the edge of the beam, but towards the centre of the beam, they become very scattered. Now, because the 660D is a little bit pricey at about 1,300 US dollars, I think it's mainly gonna have appeal to people who already have lights and already have lighting accessories and are just looking for something with a bit more firepower. So for that reason, I've decided to also test this with some third-party accessories that I have. Let's start off with the Nanlite FL20G for an L. This is delivering a surprising 9,610 lux at three meters. That's 4% less than I get out of an Aperture 600D with its gigantic F10 for an L. The barn door cuts are okay, but not fantastic. And it does spot up reasonably well. However, the shadows are a bit softer than I would expect from this Fresnel. Next, I tried the NAN light projection attachment. And as a follow spot effect, or as a light bouncing into reflectors, this does work reasonably well. It has pretty good blade cuts, much the same as it does when operating with a Forza. However, the gobos are not quite as sharp and possibly the projections are a bit milkier in the blacks. But it all comes down to how you expose it at the end of the day. All right, so let's start talking about the DMX. Now the 220D here doesn't have any DMX capability, so we won't be testing that. The 310B here does have DMX, but the DMX inputs are a micro XLR cable, so you are gonna need an optional extra adapter if you wanna feed DMX into it. The um, 660D here does have five pin DMX capability and that is via its controller power supply box. Now both lights only have the one eight bit profile so you can't select your profiles. You also cannot select what dimmer curve you'd like to be using. They both seem to be running a linear dimmer curve only. All right, let's get into the testing. I have the 660D running off an external Sierra Mix receiver. It is running off the only profile it has, which is an 8-bit single channel. Next to that, I have the 310B, which is running off an external Sierra Mix receiver. This also has only one DMX profile, which is a two-channel bicolor 8-bit. To give you something to compare the response times to, I have a Forza 720B bicolor COB light. This is also running off an 8-bit profile and is also receiving its CRMX commands via an external receiver. All three lights will be receiving their commands at the same time. Let's start off with instant on-off commands. As you can see, the 660D has a three to four second smoothing. Now to save a bit of time on this test, I'm gonna take the 660D out of the equation and just do instant on-off commands with the other two lights. Now let's have a look at some half second cues. Now let's take a look at some one second cues. Now we'll take a look at some two and a half second cues. And for this testing, I'll introduce the 660D back into the test. And now for some five second cues.
Now let's have a look at some CCT changeovers. Because the 660D is a monocolor light, I'll be taking this out of the testing. Let's start off with instant changeovers between 5600 and 3200 Kelvin. Now let's take a look at some half second cues. Now let's take a look at some one second cues. Now let's take a look at some two and a half second cues. And now some five second cues. Let's have a look at the data I've collected on the 220D, starting off with the AC power draw. The maximum power draw recorded on the 220D was 227.6 watt. Now let's take a look at the dimming characteristics. According to my frequency meter, this is running pulse width modulation at 12,500 Hz. Now this is a relatively low frequency, but despite this, there is minimal flicker with a high speed shutter. I've taken readings at 100%, 50%, 10%, and 5% brightness. The CCT is incredibly consistent. There is no change in TM30 RF color scores, and it does shift ever so slightly towards green as you're dimming it, but nothing that you would spot unless you had a color spectrometer. At full power with no modifier, I got 5,566 Kelvin with an SSI score of 74. The TM30 color render results were 94% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of 0.0010. So if your camera is working to the planking curve, this light would be imperceivably green to well under the equivalent of one half of a one eighth correction gel. And if your camera is working to the daylight curve, this light would be magenta to roughly the equivalent of around a one eighth correction gel. Let's start going through all of the data I've collected on the 310B, starting off with the AC power draw. Over several days of testing, the maximum power draw recorded was 320.1 watt. At 3200 Kelvin, I recorded 316.7 watt, and at 5600 Kelvin, I recorded 315.9 watt. Now let's take a look at the dimming characteristics. According to my frequency meter, this light is running pulse width modulation at 16,666 Hz. Now doing tests with high speed shutters at 100% brightness, I couldn't see any flicker that was worth commenting on. But during the DMX testing, when I was doing one second cues, you can see flickering on the fade ups right at the start of the transitions. Let's take a look at the results for 3200 Kelvin. I've taken readings at 100%, 50%, 10% and 5% brightness. As you can see, there is minimal change in the CCT. There is a slight change in the TM30 color render results at 50% brightness. And the white point does shift around a little bit, but you wouldn't notice it unless you had a color spectrometer. Now let's take a look at the results at 5,600 Kelvin. There is a little bit more movement in the CCT. The TM30 color render results are a constant 94, but there is quite a noticeable shift towards green when you're dimming to about the equivalent of a 1 8th correction gel. Now let's take a look at the average CCT accuracies. Between 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin, 
it was off the target value by an average of plus 46. Between 4,100 to 5,000 Kelvin, it was out by on average plus 77. Between 5,100 to 6,000 Kelvin, it was typically out by plus 101. And from 6,100 to 6,500 Kelvin, it was off the target value by an average of plus 121. Now let's have a look at the color render scores measured in TM30RF. From 2,700 Kelvin to 3,000 Kelvin, it scores a 96. Between 3,100 Kelvin to 3,800 Kelvin, it scores a 95. From 3,900 Kelvin to 5,700 Kelvin, it scores a 94. From 5,800 Kelvin to 6,200 Kelvin, it comes in with a 93. From 6,300 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin, it comes in with its lowest score of 92. Now for those people who are really into their detail, the light crosses the Planckian curve at 2,800 Kelvin and at 5,100 Kelvin. Now let's take a closer look at some of the Kelvins on the 310B, starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 2,700 Kelvin, I got 2,745. The TM30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. All of the CRI scores were plus 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0006. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,235 with an SSI score of 84. The TM30 color render results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0028. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,470. The TM30 color render results were 94% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0020, which would make the light at this point magenta to roughly the equivalent of around a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,689 with an SSI score of 73. The TM30 color render results were 94% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. Again, with the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0019, which splits the white point somewhere between the Planckian curve and the daylight curve. When I dialed in 6,500 Kelvin, I got 6,612. The TM30 color render results were 92% average color accuracy with an average 98% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9 and R12 were below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0050. Now at this point, that puts the light towards green by roughly the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. But that's the price you've got to pay on a bicolor light if you want a good white point at 5,600 Kelvin. Now let's take a look at the data I've collected for the 660D, starting off with the AC power draw. After several days of testing, the maximum power draw I recorded was 657.6 watt, and at 100% brightness, it is typically pulling around 652 to 653 watt. According to my frequency meter, this light is not using pulse width modulation dimming. I can't meter any frequency at all, which means that this light is 100% flicker free. Now let's have a look at the dimming characteristics. I've taken readings at 100%, 50%, 10% and 5% brightness. Usually lights with potentiometer dimming tend to be a little bit unstable with the CCT, but that's not the case here. The CCTs are very consistent. The TM30 color render score is a consistent 93. And what's more interesting is the white point. It pretty much doesn't shift. With no modifier on, I recorded 5,653 Kelvin with an SSI score of 73. The TM30 color render results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0007. 
So if your camera is working to the planking curve, this light would be slightly magenta at this point by an imperceivable amount. But if your camera is working to the daylight curve, it will be magenta to a little bit over the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. Well, thank you again for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Now, before we go, I just want to give you a note. So about a year ago, po possibly even longer, I reviewed a light that looked pretty much identical to this. Just the color scheme was different. Even the controller looked the same, but both lights have very different internals. The insides of them are very different. So here's something to consider. Just because the lights look the same doesn't mean they've got the same components in them. So something I've noticed with a lot of brands, particularly cheaper brands, is they might have lights that look identical. And I think that's because they're buying the housings, the actual shells from the same supplier. So just a word of caution there, don't buy another 600 watt light based on this review and expect it to be the same as the one that's here. They could be very different lights. Okay, take care everybody. See you on the next episode.